So a friend of mine had a line that he used once that I, I enjoy uh, called the devil's labs, where he referred to a number of commonly used assays in clinical medicine that uh, are subject to misinterpretation, are subject to application in the wrong clinical context. Troponin, BNP, D-dimer, lactate, and procalcitonin. I've occasionally enjoyed using this reference. I uh, once had a resident who's rounding with me who ordered a very reasonably ordered a procalcitonin on a patient under our care. And so I asked, uh, asked the young doctor, why, what did you order this test for? And he told me, he said, well, I ordered it to see if he was infected. And I, I looked at him and I said, well, I'm pretty sure that this febrile patient with a temperature of 39.2 degrees centigrade, a leukocyte count of 30,000 with a 10% bandemia on two vasopressors, I'm pretty sure he's infected. And there was no result of that procalcitonin that would convince us otherwise. Um, and I suppose that's part of what we'll talk about as we go over some of this biomarker data uh, relatively briefly is to what extent do biomarkers change clinical decisions? To what extent do we act on them? Do we only act on them when we like the answer? They only act on them when they give us an answer we, we, we want, or do they guide therapy in a way that is positive and improves care outside of the clinical trial context? So Dr. Niederman alluded to this. I'll just go over this again. What are the principal three uses for procalcitonin in the intensive care unit? I would argue they are three. Determination of viral versus bacterial pneumonia, as a gauge of illness severity, and as a tool for determining the duration of antimicrobial therapy. Well, I'm going to argue that the first two are relatively less useful in bedside practice. The third one, I think, has some very solid data, um, but solid data that can only be applied really in the appropriate context. So let's start at looking at the procalcitonin as a marker of etiology in patients hospitalized with community acquired pneumonia. This was the EPIC study that again, Dr. Niederman mentioned. And what I would draw people's attention to in the EPIC study is this. This is uh, from a different publication, not in chest, but in clinical infectious diseases of 2017. Looking at the diagnostic characteristics for Procal in patients who are initially admitted, even if you are using a very low cutoff of 0.1 nanograms per milliliter, which is considerably lower than most of our laboratories would consider for the lower cutoff, the negative predictive value for a patient admitted with to an intensive care unit with severe pneumonia is 82.4%. That's the negative predictive value. So meaning there is about an 18% chance that a given patient with a low procalcitonin, a very low procalcitonin, in fact, has a bacterial pneumonia despite that assay. A question we have to ask ourselves in this is, do we like those odds? Is a nearly one in five chance that a patient, a critically ill patient, in fact, has a bacterial infection sufficient to withhold antibiotics? I would argue for the great majority of us, it is not. But that is not a decision we're willing, we would be willing to commit to in the first 24 hours of that patient's care. So how about severity of illness? So procalcitonin clearly correlates with severity of illness. That's probably part of the reason it gets a bit confounded in, in the ICU. Well, this is one of many studies that shows here, and this was again published in, this is in critical care medicine, showing that procalcitonin correlates very nicely uh, with other biomarkers in terms of safe monitoring of antibiotics but it is also not really any different than C-reactive protein, uh, another very nonspecific biomarker. Although admittedly the procalcitonin data sets are much larger and the prospective evidence is much stronger for procalcitonin. What about COVID? In COVID-19, this was a very nice cohort. What we have seen with, with COVID-19, and I think this is also largely true of influenza, that the area under the curve, uh, the receiver operator curve of procalcitonin as a predictor for bacterial superinfection is 0.56. That is a slightly better than random odds. And what we really are seeing is that procalcitonin in the case of COVID largely correlates with disease severity. Um, I think we can all agree that community acquired severe COVID-19 pneumonia with respiratory failure initially presenting from the outside world into the ICU is very unlikely to have bacterial superinfection at the time of presentation and withholding of antibiotics there is very reasonable, at least in the patient not in shock. But the, the utility of this particular biomarker in addition to physiology is sadly, unfortunately, rather limited. Um, that doesn't mean that procalcitonin has no benefit. And I would clearly argue that it does. And one of the best validated ones, and again, we alluded to this before, the MOSES trials and the SAPS-2 trials, the PRORATA trials, all looking at different ways to use procalcitonin to guide and discontinue antibiotics 
in patients in the intensive care unit with sepsis who are improving clinically. This is an observational study from, uh, it was published in CHEST in 2017. This was done in the United States. And I, I pointed out not to say that procalcitonin doesn't have benefit, but that it needs to have its benefit interpreted in context. Um, this was a matched uh, propensity um, uh, score without regression adjustment, looking at patients who had procalcitonin guided therapy and those who did not. Uh, again, observational study. You see there is a clear reduction, 17.3 days to 14.9 days of total antibiotic exposure in patients in this. That is shaving a good two, three days off of antibiotic duration in the ICU. That is not nothing. That is also still insufficient. Uh, going from 17 days to 15, 14 to 15 days is not good enough. That is still too much antibiotic exposure. And I think it will be interesting as our antibiotic stewardship programs evolve in uh, in our respective countries where we work, to see what is the impact of this guidance if it is implemented with a general paradigm of shorter courses of therapy. What then is the benefit to biomarkers on top of that? I think that is unknown. This is an improvement. This is not good enough. That being said, you know this is a very strong meta-analysis published in 2019, looking at all of these clinical trials, ProRata, SAPS2, MOSES, and others, Integrate them saying, well, what is the actual benefit of procalcitonin in terms of reductions in antibiotic durations? And the signal is consistently positive, really with only staph aureus pneumonia being a bit vague in terms of its benefit. And that's largely due to small numbers and wide error margins. It is pretty clear that procal across a large cohort of patients does reduce um, can be used, if used wisely, to reduce the duration of antibiotic therapy without a negative impact. And as Dr. Meader mentioned, possibly reduction in mortality in our patients. So it might work, but it needs to be implemented systematically, not on an ad hoc basis. So what do we do with all this, right? What do we do with all this? How do we actually implement this into practice? Well, in addition to integrating biomarkers into a strong stewardship program, there are some novel and emerging biomarkers out there that may have some potential for us. So one is proadrenomedulin. So this is a very nonspecific marker. And what it really is, it's a product of vascular endothelial cells. And the lab actually looks for a, a mid-region of the N-terminal portion of this. It is a broadly speaking predictive of organ injury and death and correlates relatively well with SOFA score. Now the question is, if it correlates with SOFA, what do I need another blood test for? Well, it does seem to predate the onset of a worsening SOFA score in patients and could be a useful early marker of high risk. Uh, suggesting that earlier intervention and closer monitoring could be useful. This is not a biomarker of infection. This is a biomarker of organ failure, right? It does not distinguish between pathogen types. It doesn't tell between bacteria viruses and is not specific for infection per se. It's been validated in cardiogenic shock, in acute heart failure populations, uh, and in the perioperative setting as well. Again, very early data, very limited, but an interesting marker nonetheless and could be of broad interest to intensivists. Presepsin, um, Dr. Niederman alluded to this one. This is the N-terminal fragment of soluble CD14. This binds more or less specifically to lipopolysaccharide, to gram-negative endotoxin. And as a result, it seems to be a little more specific for gram-negative infections versus gram-positives. That's not the only thing it binds to, but it is somewhat suggestive. And it, as part of an integrated biomarker panel, if you have an elevated presepsin in addition to, say, uh, another more non-specific bacterial biomarker, this could push you more of a gram-negative direction theoretically. Um, it is probably an adequate ruling out sepsis, but it does seem to upregulate faster than Procal. Procal takes six to 24 hours to upregulate. Presepsin comes up faster. And this is a study comparing presepsin to procalcitonin in patients with confirmed sepsis and septic shock. And when you see at time zero, you're more likely to have a positive presepsin than you are with procalcitonin. Also like procalcitonin, this appears to decline with effective therapy and could potentially play a similar role uh, as procalcitonin as a stewardship tool. Pancreatic stone protein is an acute phase reactant produced by the exocrine pancreas. It does seem to be relatively specific for infection. It also uh, rises faster than Procal, similar to Precepsin. Uh, the data for this is largely observational, but in the chart here, this is a publication from uh, the an uh, Annals of Surgery uh, in two years ago. And what it shows is that patients with genuine sepsis would get rapid increases in, 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 excuse me, in pancreatic stone protein 
Whereas patients who are merely infected, that is to say have an infection with no organ failure, it tends to stay pretty stable. And that is a useful marker of severity. It doesn't tell you if you're infected, it tells you if you have a severe infection that puts you at risk for increased mortality. Most excitingly for me anyways, because I am a simple man and I don't like ordering extra tests, is monocyte distribution width. So this is available on routine complete blood counts that you have a, have a leukocyte differential. An increased MDW of greater than 20 may correlate well with sepsis. This is pathogen agnostic. It does not distinguish between viral bacterial diseases. This could give us potentially actionable data. This is widely available. And if prospectively validated, which is not yet the case, if we could use MDW to distinguish between sepsis versus cardiogenic shock at the time of presentation, for example, this is a sort of tool that would have potential for altering care at the bedside. It is rapidly available as well. Uh, do note in this chart here that the area under the curve um, and the uh, receiver operator curve of MDW is about the same as CRP and procalcitonin. This is not a unique tool in of itself. Although its sensitivity is a little higher, that is at the cost of some specificity. There is no silver bullet is what it comes down to. There is no blood test that will solve our problems. And I argued in the article uh, that uh, uh, Professor Vassant kindly let me write for, uh, for the magazine that the most useful biomarker in the ICU are the eyes, ears, hands, and brain of a skilled intensivist, right? I'm not saying that our that we are 100% sensitive and specific, far from it. I am just saying that there is currently no blood test that is less, that, excuse me, that is less inaccurate than I am, right? We have a ways to go before that. And in the context of antibiotic shortening, uh, Brad Spellberg, uh, who is a professor at the University of Southern California here in the United States, in ID land has made a big push for this notion of shorter is better as a tool of stewardship. Things like procalcitonin guided therapy clearly can play a role but they only are going to play a useful role if we first of all embrace this. Short courses of high doses of appropriate direct pathogen-directed therapy. We get that right, then we'll see what procalcitonin does for us.